Welcome to another edition of Journey of Hope. Stories of people that have been impacted by the healing ministry of Loma Linda. People from around the world that have come to Loma Linda to be treated. Our special guest today is John Zuli, speaker, author, seminar leader, uh, martial arts specialist, runner, I could go on and on. John, it's good to have you here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Lynn. Thanks so much for having me. John is a cancer survivor. And uh, before we talk about his cancer and his journey here to Loma Linda, we want to talk about your journey, where you came from, a little bit about your background. I mean, I've uh, looked look at some of the things about it in your book here, and it's entitled The Mind Rules. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But you're a performance coach, but you didn't start out that way. Where are you from? Tell us a little bit. Well, we got an audience watching from around the world. I, Lynn, I was born in a little town in upstate New York in the Catskill Mountains, and I was very fortunate in 1979 I came to... Uh, uh, state of California. Uh, I traveled much of the United States, all through Canada and Mexico, went to school uh, for a period of time at the University of Florida, and uh, found my way out here. I was very, very lucky. I, um, I saw something I had never seen before in New York or many of my travels. It was something called a park ranger. And uh, a little place called Lake San Antonio, Lake Nascimento on the central coast of California. I saw this man get out of a boat, and I asked the, uh, he was getting gas at this gas dock, and I asked the gas jockey, I said, well, what's he do? And he says, oh, he's the park ranger. I said, he rides around here all day in a boat, and he gets paid for it? They said, oh, yeah, that's what he does. Well, I didn't realize it was quite so much law enforcement. I got involved. I really wanted that job. I put myself uh, uh, into school to be able to get a degree specifically for that. So now, when you came here to California, you'd been in Florida at a, at a university or college, but hadn't graduated. No, I didn't graduate from okay. the University and of Florida. You, you came out here and saw this park ranger. And decided that that was a career. I wanted to be outside. What I didn't realize, it was very intense law enforcement. And uh, in the summertime, I could write up to 75 tickets uh, on a holiday weekend. Uh, we could affect two or three different types of arrests. Uh, and I flourished. I really would never have imagined in an authority position like that, I would have flourished. But I did, and I have, I've managed golf courses. I have managed a bonsai nursery. I drove big rigs, uh, managed restaurants. I had many, many careers, but park, parks and recreation really fit me. It really did. And I became my department's defensive tactics instructor, and this is what changed my life. I started to teach peace officers the martial arts, and when I did, uh, I noticed these guys who were normally, you know, very proficient in, their, uh, in the field applying uh, martial arts, but when they got into the testing process, they'd fall to pieces. And they used to come to me and they'd be shaking and I'd say, you know, what do you think I'm going to fail you? I'll be, you know, I'll be calling for help on the radio when I need backup and uh, no one will have their radio on. I said, I'm not going to fail you. All you'll need to do is remediate. It's no big deal. And they all said the same thing, Lynn. They said, look, John, I know logically, reasonably, rationally, that there's no reason to be afraid when I come in here. But when I see you stand there with that clipboard and you're scoring me, I start falling apart. I can't think straight. My palms sweat. Test anxiety. So I started to look into all different types of ways. I mean, anything I could find, autogenic training, meditation, anything I could find to help these guys. And I began to see that there was little systems about how the mind worked. I began to teach these guys these systems. They overcame their test anxiety. One thing led to another. And I got somewhat of a reputation about teaching this stuff. And I was approached by a company who was very forward thinking. Uh, and they asked me if I would teach some stress management classes. I said, well, what would you like me to teach? And they said, whatever you think is best. And I began well, an a career. open door then. Exactly. And I began a career. I wrote a, I'll never forget it, I wrote on a napkin about 10 different ideas that I had, and a speaking career was launched. About 10 years after I was with the Parks Department, I went out on my own. I began lecturing and speaking. And I see my job now as... You know how most people feel there's a lot more potential inside of themselves than they can actualize. Well, what I do now is I teach people how to go inside and bring all that potential out. We've been given such tremendous gifts by our Creator. Uh, we have this wonderful thing called a mind. And, you know, it's like Charlie Brown said, uh, life is like a 10-speed bicycle. Most of us have gears we never use. <laughs> and my job is to show people how to get those gears in gear. So, you know, you've been working with not only individuals, but apparently with some corporations and businesses. Who are some of the clients that you've had? You know, I've gotten, I've gotten a, uh, very fortunate in the last few years. I worked with the, the uh, disabled American veterans. I got to work at Walter Reed Army Hospital. Um, I've done a lot of work for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. 
Um, and for larger corporations, Detroit Diesel, Wells Fargo, GMAC Mortgage, um, I've gotten some pretty big ones in there. So, uh, uh, Citibank, Capital One, a lot of uh, people that know that their people need something. Uh, and I was able to go in there and give them that thing that they needed. So one of your job descriptions really was performance, uh, performance coach then. I believe that, you know, we talk about this wonderful place that athletes get into. You know, when we see Tiger Woods out there on the golf course, kind we talk zone. about, that's it. That's it. That's that place. You know, that very expensive real estate. Yes. Now, what people don't understand is that Tiger did a lot of mind-body training to get to where he is. He just wasn't born with that unshakable focus that he has. And my belief is that we all have inside of us, it's, let me say it this way, it's natural for us to get into the zone. But what we do as we become adults, as children it's natural, as we become adults, we begin to do things with our mind in such a way to keep ourselves out of the zone. Oh, you know, the golfer will tell themselves, oh, the front nine was really great, that means the back nine is going to be terrible. I'll and make up for it. The, yeah. Right, these, these belief systems begin to get lodged in our mind, and we don't access those resources that we have as well. I believe that uh, with very little training, anybody can develop a synergism of mind and body and far outstrip what their 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 um, belief systems and 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 to do things that they just didn't think were possible, and I know this because for 20 years I've been helping people to do those very things. So this is where this book, The Mind Rules, came about. Then exactly, that's 20 years. It took me six months to write, 20 years to develop to get the uh, information uh, straightened out. But it's it's that I believe that I believe the mind rules. I think that that we, as I said, we've been endowed with this tremendous tremendous tool and it's up to us to put it into play. You know, we have this ability to use our imagination. We have this ability to direct our attention. You know, I know that you do a lot of climbing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're thinking about falling, much more difficult to climb up that mountain. You're absolutely when you're right. thinking about and the tendency to fall is going to be much higher. Exactly. What, there's a rule in the mind that says what's expected tends to be realized. And when you think about falling, it's, it's a greater likelihood that that's going to happen. But when you focus your attention where you want it to be, when you focus your attention on where you're going to put your next handhold or where your foot's going to go and where you're going to go, that changes that expectation. And people end up exceeding their own belief systems. How did you, uh, how did you get into martial arts? Um, like most uh, uh, kids that grew up uh, watching uh, movies, I saw James Bond give a karate chop and I said I have to know how to do that. And of course I was very blessed to be involved at a time when the martial arts was very popular in the early 70s in this country. And a man by the name of Bruce Lee. Uh, Bruce and I are about the same size. I began, I started to look into what he taught. It's a, it's a type of martial art called, called Jeet Kune Do or the way of the intercepting fist and uh, it just intrigued me and I began to get more and more involved and then I started to, I was a state uh, certified defensive tactics instructor and uh, uh, so really it was, it was that, it, it, what I wanted I think is what most 16 year old boys want and that is control. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to control myself, I wanted to have self discipline, I wanted to be tough and uh, I believe that the martial arts gave me pointed me in the right direction. How do I get that internal process going? You know, Gave a framework for discipline and self-control and one thing or another. And I know as I was, uh, as I've gotten acquainted with you, you were a university president also here I was, in California. I was the president of Corentry University, which is a, a small university out of Marina Del Rey. Uh, it is a state of California approved university which offered a, a state of California approved PhD program in naturopathic medicines. Uh, holistic health studies and uh, homeopathy. Uh, I don't really know much about those medicines, but I did know how to run a university, and that's what I was there for. All right. Then uh, you, you wrote the book. How long has the book been out? The book came out in 2005. In 2005. If somebody wanted to get this book, where would they go? Well, there's two places. The first is, is Amazon.com. We're in between printings right now. They're actually a little tough to get a, a hold of. I've been trying to get a case for some of our friends at the Proton Therapy Group, um, and it's not that easy. The other is, is they could go to my website, which is johnzuli.com. So J O H N Z U L L I dot com. And uh, there's so, where the book is available. So it's available right there. there. Now, you are a, a, an athlete, you're a martial arts, you're a runner, done a lot of different things, you're Mr. Invincible. <laughs> and yet you found out you were diagnosed with cancer. Tell me about how it is when you're invincible 
and then you're diagnosed with cancer. What does it do to you? Well, you go from being, uh, you know, James Arnest to Barney Fife. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> right. I mean, you, you go pretty much overnight. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's Matt Dillon to Barney Fife. I, it was more than that, though. You know, on top of being a very upbeat person, teaching people how to get the most out of their mind and body, I mean, aside from being my job, Lynn, I've been a vegetarian for 25 years, close to vegan. Okay. I am, like I said, avid. I take care of myself. I watch what I, uh, what I put in my body. A friend of mine, uh, they were over at the house, uh, and uh, their 14-year-old went into the cupboard and said, Mom, I can't find anything here for me to eat. It's all organic. <laughs> You know, so so it was such for a... For 25 years, right, almost. For 25 years. Okay. And, uh, you know, I live... Doing a, everything right. Everything right. I live in an environment which is low pollution. It's, you know, it, as I said, every single thing right. So the first shock actually came when I was diagnosed with AFib. And uh, that's uh, an irregular heartbeat for people that may not be familiar with the medical term. And uh, it was a just a devastating blow because it meant I had to start limiting my exercise and all kinds of things. And I thought, that's incredible. Then I had a squamous cell skin cancer. This is, and by the way, for the first 50 years, I mean, there were many years I didn't even have health insurance. I thought, well, you know, that's for losers. Stay, you never go to a doctor. Never go to a doctor, don't have to go. And, you know, why would, why would anyone need health insurance? It's a waste of money. Well, when I hit 50 and I said I was diagnosed with the AFib, I decided maybe I need to take a little bit look. Then the squamous cell uh, cancer, which isn't that big a deal, but it's not the, you know, it's, it's not, not the least. It's not that big a deal when you have it, but when I've got it, it's something else. So it's, exactly. it hits you. And they cut that out. And then uh, the crowning glory. I uh, went to see my uh, doctor. They did a standard blood test. They came back with a PSA score of about 8. And he said, we need to get you in for a biopsy. Now, I have to point something else out. Okay. I never imagined ever in my entire life that I would be sick. I, w I just figured I was going to go like this to about 98, 99, and just kind of kill over. Go out. Sure. And I had a great role model. I did many films uh, a few years back with Jack LaLanne. And I saw myself like Jack. You know, never sick a day in your life, never go to the hospital, none of this. So when the biopsy came back positive, I was floored. I was devastated. Now, many people will say uh, that, that a patient will go into a depression. I don't think that's what it is. It was grief. My life was changing dramatically. Um, you know, I mean, I saw things, I knew that many things were going to end. I knew that many, uh, that many changes uh, were going to occur I wasn't going to like. And for the first time in my entire life, I tasted my own mortality. Face to face with it. And it slapped me hard. And for the, I will admit, for the first two months, I was uh, very down. And I did what most men do. I withdrew into my cave. And uh, uh, pretty much I closed everybody out. And I finally came out of that and made a decision. I had to do something. Now, you had to take responsibility for it. Exactly. Because I knew that there was, the one option that wasn't available to me was doing nothing. So I went and uh, I uh, met with a, a physician who wanted to do the robotic surgery and oh, he thought that was the greatest thing in the world and I said, well, how many of these have you done? He says, oh, about 150. <laughs> so I, I called some friends who were very influential and they was, I was, um, had the opportunity to go to Sloan Kettering in New York and I was attended by one of the, the number one uh, surgeons in the country who was going to do the surgery. I came back to uh, uh, California to prepare to go to New York and spend my time there and kind of button up some loose ends in case something should happen on the operating table. I mean, you know, I, I, I was, I told the physician, I said, look, when I come in to New York, the night before the surgery, you're going to need to uh, sedate me. And he thought I was kidding. I said, no, I see myself running down 65th Street in New York City with a hospital gown on, heading for the river, getting out of there, because there's nothing wrong with me. I have no symptoms whatsoever. Just these numbers are off in this biopsy. So uh, to make a long story short, I came back to California, and uh, I know that uh, you've probably said it on the show before, nobody ends up at Loma Linda by accident. That is true. I was contacted by a woman now, but a girl then, that I dated when I was 15 years old. I hadn't talked to her in 25 years, and she is a very alternative medicine type of person. So I asked her, I said, well, what do you have to offer somebody that has prostate cancer? And she gave me a lot of treatment options, which included things like uh, tremendous amounts of vegetable juicing, the Gerson diet, I believe it's called, coffee enemas, which really didn't appeal to me all that much. And at the very bottom, she sent me an email with all these websites. At the very bottom, there was this Proton Bob website. 
And I thought, well, gee, let's go check it out. And I saw it was attached to Loma Linda, a name I knew. And I was three days from leaving for the surgery. I called the, my doctor there and I said, remember how you said I could cancel uh, if I really wanted to? I said, I'm going to postpone it. I began to look into proton therapy and I realized very quickly that this is the closest thing we have to Star Trek uh, available <laughs> to us today. 21st century. Exactly. You know, it is. it was so remarkable and I could see that this wasn't, because I, I was not going to do radiation, I was going to do the surgery, uh, because of the effects, the, the negative effects of photon radiation. Uh, so I went ahead and began to look into it and I began to become almost uh, my life, my job every day was to get into Loma Linda and to get into this program. And you finally were able to get in. Now you've completed your treatments and you're a cancer survivor. Uh, but tell me about your experience while you've been here at Loma Linda while you're while you in treatment. One of the, th the programs I teach is leadership. And when I go into organizations, we do, we, we, it's very difficult to balance things like warmth and professionalism. It's very diff difficult to balance, that, to walk that line between feeling compassion and empathy and getting your job done. Uh, this has been one of the most fabulous experiences of my entire life. I would never have imagined how upbeat, enthusiastic, how uh, tremendously caring a staff could be. And this all comes from leadership. I'm absolutely certain that the people, the leaders that are involved in this, in the Proton work, are the people that are directing, are setting such an example for the employees that they are, uh, it, it's just phenomenal. And so uh, what's happened here is not only am I getting the highest standard of care, that people are so professional and, uh, and so precise in what they're doing, I'm being treated like a human being. This is the difference between practitioner-centered therapies, where it's all about the doctor. You know, there's a lot of doctors out there. I'm sure you see them every now and again from other facilities. They think MD stands for medical deity. <laughs> yes. You know, and, and, and it, I understand you, you work very hard to get where you are. But the bottom line is, is that this is, this is, this is patient-centered therapy. And it's, it's truly, truly remarkable. But I don't want anyone to think this is just warm fuzzies. I mean, yes, there is a lot of that, but these are people that are dedicated to doing a good job, an extraordinary job, an exceptional job. Well, as you know, one of, uh, the, actually, the undergirding philosophy of Loma Linda is to make man whole, mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. And we, um, we are attempting to do that as we make an impact upon patients. So while you're here, uh, did, did you get involved in some of the activities that were going along? You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm a kind of a, um, uh, I'm not much of a joiner, let's put it that way. But I did, I got, I got sucked right into everything. I went to the symphony. I, we were at the uh, Tuesday night potlucks. I was at the Wednesday night meetings. And what a feeling of camaraderie. And it, as, as somebody once said, it's like a, it's like a, a camp for guys with prostate cancer. <laughs> And so it is, it was very uplifting, and the, I've walked out of here with, I'm going to leave here with people that are going to be lifelong friends, like yourself. Well, John, that's one of the things we try to do is get people involved. We tell a patient the worst thing they can do is come in for their treatment and then head back to their place and sit in front of a TV or read a book and isolate themselves. The best thing they can do is to get involved and we provide a number of tools and resources for people and you know people talk about the magic of Loma Linda and people talk about a radiation vacation and uh, I heard you just say you know it was a, a, a fabulous experience. Now who would have thought getting cancer was a fabulous experience? That's, and that really is the, the, I mean, the funny part of, if you, and I do mean funny as in smiling and laughing. Uh, you just wouldn't imagine so many upbeat people facing a diagnosis of cancer. And granted, it is a very treatable cancer, but this is a very, this is a non-invasive procedure. I mean, as far as the therapy itself is concerned, it's as easy as getting your picture taken. And, and yet so very effective. I've talked to people that, are, that came here with PSA numbers as high as 30. Ten years later, their, PSA, their PSAs is 0 .02, 0 .01, and it's been holding that way for eight years. Um, you know, it, it is truly remarkable. It's space age. And you said something a second ago. You said we're attempting to fulfill our mission of making man whole. When I came here, I was fractured. I was hurt. I was, uh, I was feeling that a lot of the good effort and energy that I had put out to keep myself healthy uh, hadn't worked. Something had gone wrong. Something had gone wrong. 
but uh, I'm leaving here and I feel whole. That's what we want. I mean, we're, and you are whole. Uh, I often tell people that, you know, the good news is they were diagnosed. Yes. Because until you're diagnosed, you've already got the cancer, you just don't know about it, but once you're diagnosed, you can begin taking steps. And uh, we often talk about, you know, uh, being diagnosed is not a death sentence. Mr. Invincible, you were diagnosed, you've overcome other things, your cancer was taken care of, you can go on about your life. And when people come here, uh, I tell them, quit thinking about dying. Start thinking about a living. Yeah. I mean, uh, all of us have only one day. It's never yesterday. It's never tomorrow. It's always today. Uh, we got people from around the world that are watching, and, and uh, they, too, have just, some of them have just been diagnosed. What would you tell somebody that's just been diagnosed with cancer? You have to be active. You must participate in your recovery. You have to research what's going to be right for you. You have to get involved. You're not, if you sit back and just listen to what your doctors say, um, you're going to end up involved or doing things that perhaps aren't right for you. You must be your own advocate and look at your treatment options. Look and see what's available. I could have gone to other facilities that offer Proton, but I came here because I went to the website, I talked to the people that gave the testimonials, I got involved and I asked them, I said, what's the difference between here and some other place? And they said, at Loma Linda, you will be taken care of. At Loma Linda, they know what they're doing. Other places might be involved in research. Loma Linda is involved in curing people. Well, as you know, we've been in this particular place for over 100 years. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists are in the healing ministry. I mean, all around the world, we've got medical launches and medical facilities. But we've been right here for 100 years. And we think there's a difference. And, you know, people do talk about the difference that... Uh, that they experience here at uh, Loma Linda. Now, this matter of the mind, we, I, I know one night we had you make a presentation and you talked about fear. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of fear when you're diagnosed with cancer. How do you overcome fear? Well, again, I think that you know, the, the antidote to fear is learning that you can cope. Knowing that, uh, again, that you're involved, that you're, that you're doing something. Um, it's a matter of control, isn't it? I, I think, yes, it's a, it's a matter of doing. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about optimism, the word optimism, uh, but very few people understand what that means. You know, it doesn't have to do with wearing rose-colored glasses. It doesn't have to do with thinking, oh, everything's going to be okay. What it has to do with is saying, what can I do? How can I get involved? What do I need? You know, when the physician says, you know, you have this, they say, well, how do, I, how do I take care of it? How do I get involved? Optimism, uh, op, is a Latin term. It means power. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, like I said, thinking happy thoughts or going to your happy place. Uh, optimism means power, and power comes from doing. And that's what, we, that's what I would recommend to anybody that has any type of diagnosis. Get involved. Find out what can I do. And that's the antidote to fear. And look, you know, fear's not the worst thing that ever happened. Fear right. motivates people. You know, uh, you know, when my doctor said, you need to look into this, if I hadn't been afraid, I might have waited a year, two, or three, And or some four. people do. And some people do. I mean, some people are afraid to go to the doctor for fear of what they're going to find out, and mm -hmm. they avoid putting it off. Uh, what difference is having cancer, having had cancer, making to you in your life, in your future? Well... There's no doubt that every moment becomes much more precious when you're faced with your own mortality. When you realize that this isn't, the, you know, this is a, um, this is all our last season here, you know, I mean, we're not, you're not going to get a, a, a second chance at this. Um, I think that it makes life much more precious. And, you know, it's also, it's also caused me to want to take more steps for my health. I want to point something out. I reconciled all that good stuff that I did for myself by realizing if I hadn't taken care of myself that yeah. way, maybe I would have had cancer at 40 or 30, some of the people that we see. So, uh, you know, it, I, I was able to overcome that hurdle by realizing, you know, these were so good So you're not going to be changing. You're still going to be living yeah, right. the, the good life and discipline. You're... That's right. No cigarettes, no, uh, no booze, uh, I, you know, no caffeine. Uh, I'm going to stay on, the, on the, uh, the good foot, so to speak. Uh, but I do. I, I have a deeper appreciation for the day-to-day -day and also for taking rest. You know, I mean, one of the, one of the big Adventist uh, concepts is, is the Sabbath and resting. And I realize that, you know, rest is, a, rest is doing something. You're absolutely right. And 
you know, it's it's called balance. It's mm -hmm. the it's the total program and and living a life where there is balance in your life. Uh, you're going to be able to relate to people that are identified with cancer now, and you're going to find the people are coming out of the woodwork. Uh, you're going to discover when you get back home that people are going to hear that you were treated, and uh, you're going to be able to tell them about your experience. And we do believe that uh, out of the thousands upon thousands of people that are diagnosed with, with cancer or some other disease, only a few, relatively speaking, come here to Loma Linda. And that's why I often say, you know, nobody comes here by accident. No. And some people come here being treated for cancer, but they discover so many other things about themselves. And I'm sure you've discovered that in, in your relationship with these people. We have people from around the world. And uh, as they get here, they begin to reflect and think about uh, who they are and where they're going and what the future holds and what's really important in life. Last night when we had the uh, little um, meeting, uh, as I said to those folks then, you've been spared. You've been spared dying of prostate cancer. Why? What will you do with that time? How will you spend the remaining years that you have now that you've been given a second chance? I hope that those people have took that, those concepts and ideas to heart and they realize, you know, I can make a difference in this world. I can make a contribution or I can watch television. That's right. Well, John, it's so good to have you with us here on LLBN. We've got people from around the world that are watching. And I know that uh, you're going to make a difference as you go out and go back and interact and travel across the country meeting people. For those in the audience that are watching, uh, I want to thank you. I'm Lynn Martell with uh, Loma Linda Broadcasting Network and with the uh, medical center here. And we want to thank you for joining us. And I know that uh, there are people there that have just been diagnosed with some kind of a problem. God is waiting for you to turn to him. Thank you so much. See you next week. God bless you.